deep in southern Utah, where the rocks bend and bulge. A remote mountain range rises above the arid earth. Skirted with pinyon juniper woodland, draped in aspen, and crowned by 11,000 foot alpine meadows, the Henry Mountains beckon as a floating oasis in the desert, a green island in the sky. A few friends and I have journeyed to the Henrys this summer, not just for the mountains, but a secret they conceal. Here, a herd of free roaming American bison, reintroduced 70 years ago, call the Henrys home. What happens when you reintroduce bison to a modern landscape? We've come a long way to find out. The story of the Henry Mountains bison reintroduction begins 300 years ago when 30 million bison roamed the United States. Then came the pioneers pushing west, followed by the cavalry and the railroad. Slaughtered for meat and forced off their native range, the last wild herds were decimated by hide hunters selling bison skins for profit back east. Like the wolf and the grizzly, bison fell before the altar of manifest destiny and the demands of a growing global economy. The empty space left by bison was quickly filled with a familiar combination, cowboys and cattle. By the end of the 1800s, the frontier had closed and 30 million bison were replaced by 50 million cows. Only a few wild bison hung on. Congress created Yellowstone National Park in 1872, the first major conservation act of its kind. In the refuge of these protected boundaries, wild bison would begin their recovery. In 1902, 24 bison occupied Yellowstone. Now, over 4,000 populate the park. Today, the Yellowstone herd is still restricted to the park's boundary. Bison that wander outside of this invisible line are rounded up, placed in pens, and tested for diseases that can be transmitted to cattle. Those that test positive are sent to slaughter. Montana cattlemen and state officials, in an effort to protect the state's livestock industry, legally insist upon this practice. I lived in Yellowstone National Park 10 years ago and watched one of these bison roundups. I saw their eyes bulge with fear as riders pushed them into pens. It was then that I began researching, looking for a herd of American bison that still roamed free from fences and annual roundups. I only found one. In 1942, a group of Utah sportsmen convinced government officials that bison should be reintroduced into southern Utah. Without much fanfare, 18 animals were trapped in Yellowstone, rounded up onto trucks, and driven south. Ancestors of the last wild and genetically pure bison returned to a portion of their former range. Today, the Henry Mountains bison herd freely roams over 385,000 acres. Despite all this space, Henry Mountains bison are caught within a complex web of public lands, grass, ranching, and two government agencies, the United States Bureau of Land Management and the Utah State Division of Wildlife Resources. A very unique part of 
Bison Management and Henry Mountains is a cooperation in the relationship we have with the Bureau of Land Management. The BLM manages the Henry Mountains area according to our resource management plan and decisions in that management plan specifically for bison management as well as other multiple uses that occur on, on the range. While the management plan provides opportunities for mining, hunting, and recreation, the largest use of public land in the Henrys is cattle grazing. The plan allows for grazing permits, known as allotments, to be issued to private ranchers. Some of these allotments have been in existence since before the bison were reintroduced. That's all I've done most of my life, and I, uh, I've raised a family on the ranch and taught them how to work. Family Ranch has been in the family for four generations. We've been in the livestock industry for six generations, which is the case with most of the people that have permit around the Henry Mountains. The cattle have been grazing on the Sandy Ranch allotment since the 1930s, and also the neighboring uh, permittees have had cattle here, the same families since that time. The BLM and DWR work together to solve a problem plaguing all public land managers how to balance uses that compete and even clash with other groups utilizing the same public resource. You can think about on this landscape, there's only so much grass available. And where we have both bison and cattle sharing the landscape and they have such similar uh, dietary requirements, there's only so much food to go around. We call that the idea of carrying capacity. There's also this idea of social carrying capacity and that's just kind of how many individuals is the local community willing to tolerate? DWR, working with the BLM, has determined the carrying capacity for the Henry Mountains bison to be 325 total animals. If the herd gets any larger, cattle grazing will be impacted. This number was established during an intense public negotiation process in 2007. Sportsmen groups, ranchers, and community leaders all provided input. Some folks wanted even more bison. The ranchers did not. To monitor the population size, DWR commissions a helicopter each August for an aerial bison count. Based upon how many bison they find, the state issues once-in-a-lifetime hunting tags to bring the population back down to 325 animals. You have to be able to manage that and manage these multiple uses, uh, recognizing that you know cattle ranching, that's a tradition in this area, and that's an important lifestyle, and we don't want to take away from that. But we still want to maintain our bison population at a healthy level. And so you're trying to find a balance of these kind of ecological and social carrying capacities. And hunting is the main tool to, to keep these populations in check. Most any other bison population in the world, the bison are rounded up annually and, and herded into pens just like cattle and, and often sold at auctions or culled. Uh, and that's just a really unnatural state for a wild animal like a bison to be in. You know, these are not just shaggy cows and we can't necessarily treat them as such. If you're going to have bison free ranging on public land, which is the model, the, the best model for the ecological restoration of bison, you have to have a way to control the population. If we didn't have hunting as a tool to manage bison on the Henry Mountains, we probably couldn't have bison here. Whether you like hunting or not, organized sportsmen groups and lawmakers creating policy on their behalf have a long record of preserving both habitat and species. In the Henry Mountains, sportsmen have indirectly created a unique outcome, wild, free-roaming bison in a country largely devoid of them. Reintroducing bison can be really important because bison are what we call a, a keystone species, which means that their, their impact on the landscape and all the different plants and animals that live there is disproportionate to their biomass. You know, they have a, a larger impact than you would expect. Uh, just through their different grazing behaviors and, and the different behaviors that they do that we often don't see in cattle. 
Bison have a, a very heterogeneous uh, grazing pattern where they graze some areas very heavily and leave some areas completely untouched. And that creates different habitat types for like different birds, for example. Some need very short clipped grass. That's where they like to nest and that's where they forage. Others need very dense grass and they need stuff that hasn't been grazed. Uh, bison also have this wallowing behavior where they roll around in the dust and, and create these compacted areas that hold water, um, which can be really important, particularly in desert areas like this, as well as that compaction, that disturbance opens up space for, for certain plant species that are maybe really poor competitors, but very good at taking advantages of a highly disturbed areas. So they provide a lot of different habitat heterogeneity uh, that's just really important on the landscape. Not only does bison reintroduction benefit biological diversity, it adds an intrinsic aura to the natural surroundings. Wildlife alone can transform a collection of water, plants, and terrain into the wild places that we love. For what is the thicket without hope of a buck? The high country without scold of a Clark's nutcracker? In American landscape without the wonder of this iconic mammal? One of the hopes that I have is we can maintain this and manage this in a way to protect what, this ha what we have here so that my children, my grandchildren, and others in the future can experience the same thing. So that we as a nation can have a connection to our past and bison are a huge part of that. For me, it's like, this is something that can matter. This is something that when I'm gone, I don't care if people know my name. I just want somebody somewhere, some little kid to be able to say, wow. There's just something raw about the bison. It's, it's the American animal. You start to develop a connection with the land and with the bison when you start to see the world through their eyes and you realize that kind of our human perceptions of what is important uh, is really lacking and we're really missing the mark. And, and it's nice to come back up here, see these bison, these consummate survivors you know, the icon of the wild and the, the stubborn creatures that they are just making their way. But I put pack saddles on, I take our family, we go into the mountain and we can find isolation. And there we look at Buffalo and, and the incredible experience of this mountain. And I come back here because I love it. This is my heart and soul, this mountain, this experience. In my opinion, this really is kind of the crown jewel of bison conservation because here we have a place where we have public bison roaming public land. They're genetically pure, they're disease free, they're free ranging. This is the only place that can say that. Because they are disease free, they do have the potential to be used as a source population to start up other bison herds in other areas. The Henry Mountains herd represents the first reintroduction of free roaming bison outside of Yellowstone National Park. It won't be the last. In 2016, former President Barack Obama signed the National Bison Legacy Act, designated bison as the national mammal. Additional bison reintroductions have already transpired or are being planned right now. Efforts like the E&E &E Initiative and the American Prairie Reserve. These reintroductions, like the Henry's, will rely on community stewardship models in which resource agencies are just one bison manager alongside nonprofits, community representatives, Native American groups, and private property owners. We can't manage bison in a vacuum. They range on a public resource. We have to find out what are their needs, what are the needs of the other resource users, and balance those with the needs of, of the bison themselves. Continued collaboration with private property owners may be the biggest lesson learned from the Henry Mountains bison reintroduction. In almost every location where bison have or will be reintroduced, private property will be impacted. Specifically, this means cattle and ranchers. Even now, 10 years after the population size establishment, bison foraging patterns have changed and the cattle ranchers are growing frustrated. The 
The biggest problem that we're having right now, the issue, and it's been the biggest one since they moved on to this side of the mountain, is the buffalo tend to come down onto the uh, winter allotments during the summer. Does it happen every year? No. Does it happen? Yes. That's the severe impact, what they're doing in the winter. Here in the summer on this mountain, there's plenty of feed, there's room for everyone. It's the impact in the winter. As ranchers, we make our living on that grass and on those shrubs and herbs to winter feed. I work with ranches in the area. I, I understand those guys, those ranches are, don't make money. It's, it's a hard lifestyle, it's hard work and good people. They don't wish anything bad, but the difference for them is Am I going to be able to feed my family this year or not? So when you take my grass and, you, and, and we have to buy hay to supplement it, then it keeps us from paying our help better. It keeps this from being an economical unit. It, and people, the public has got to understand that there's only so much money you can generate off agriculture. I'm paying some of these cowboys that ride seven days a week, 1400 a month. Could the public live on that? No, but that's all we can afford to pay them. We all need to work together, and and we're we're right in the heart of this buffalo herd. We're right all the way up through the heart of it. It's like a chicken and a pig talking about their contribution to breakfast. The the pig gives a considerable more than the chicken. Those of us whose pocketbook is infected in our lives for generations, we give a lot more. And so it's hard to arrive at a compromise that is applicable and amenable to everyone. It's easy for special interest groups, and here I'm speaking to myself, my friends, and others, to roll our eyes at ranchers like these. The temptation is to push for full-scale bison reintroduction across the West in order to correct a mistake of our past. But out in Utah, Walking through ancient canyons with folks who love this land as much as you and I, my folly was realized. In today's modern landscape, bison will only return and thrive through compromise. I think one way we can try to help ease the conflict between stated federal agencies and the, the local grazers, uh, the permittees in this area, is perhaps by borrowing some of the ideas that we've shown to be successful in conservation in the developing world, more community-based wildlife management, where the, the local permittees are able to derive some direct tangible benefit from having bison on this landscape that helps to defray some of those costs or at a minimum incentivize them to, to be more wildlife friendly and, and bison friendly in their grazing practices. We can deal with things objectively. We can keep the ranchers happy, we can keep the environmental groups happy, we can keep the sportsmen's groups happy, but the only way they're going to be happy is if they sit down and work together. I speak of an American compromise. If all parties give until it hurts, then it's a real compromise. We can not only have more bison on the landscape, but we can do it without negatively impacting the local community and perhaps while actually enhancing it. Our time spent in the Henrys has made one thing clear. Bison and private interests can coexist. This arrangement needs to be refreshed from time to time and new compromises must be reached. This will not be an easy task, nor one accomplished by pro-bison interest groups acting alone. Scientific research, transparency of government agencies, and continued inclusion of livestock operators within the public process are necessary if wild bison are given the chance to belong. More than just proving bison reintroduction is possible, the Henry Mountains example has forged the foundation of what could become a new American ideal. For over a century, 10-gallon hats, saddles, and spurs have been celebrated American symbols, and with good reason too, for the cowboy embodies values that many of us hold dear. Hard work, rugged individualism, in a continuation of the frontier spirit, the taming of a continent. But in the Henry Mountains, and other places too, perhaps there is enough space and diversity of thought for a second symbol, the bison. 
returning to the country of its birth, a woolly representation of differing American values, yet equal in their own right. Perseverance, public land, compromise, and a living reminder of all that once roamed wild and free, and still could again. <laughs>